today's World Insight. When China sneezes, the rest of the world catches a cold. How true for the COVID-19 epidemic. And a test for China-U.S. relations under the strain of a viral outbreak in the words of a longtime U.S. diplomat on China. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight coming to you from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. We start with the latest on the novel coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. China has confirmed nearly 75,000 COVID-19 patients with more than 49,000 suspected cases. More than 2,100 people have died. The number of recovered cases is rising to almost eight times the death toll. More confirmed cases were also reported in other countries around the world. Meanwhile, with almost the businesses suspended, factories still mainly closed, and people, some of them, are still being urged to stay at home. China's economic growth is hitting the bricks, some suggest, particularly in the first quarter. Many are worried about its broader impact on the global economy. Before we get down to a discussion with our panelists about that, take a look at this first. When China sneezes, could the rest of the world catch the flu? So goes the old maxim on the Chinese economy's influence beyond its borders. Many are looking for clues about the extent of the impact on the global economy. Foreign businesses in China are taking a hit, as many staff still cannot come to work yet. Some of China's southeast neighbors are among the worst hit globally. Altogether, more than 150 COVID-19 cases have been confirmed in six ASEAN countries, with one death. As a major holiday destination for Chinese tourists, the region has suffered tremendously from a dramatic dive in holiday makers. Other industries are also struggling. Some European countries are having similar troubles. The Chinese make up 35 percent of the global consumers of luxury goods. Half of those purchases are made in China, the other half overseas, in places like France. A fall in Chinese tourists and a drop in output from production centers in China due to the epidemic are a drag on France's retail industries. Visitors from China are some of the big spenders in France, where high fashion has also taken a hit. The outlook for the EU economy is subject to new downside risks First and foremost, the outbreak and spread of the coronavirus, its impact on public health, human lives and economic activities remain uncertain. The COVID-19 epidemic also means there is an extra hurdle for the global supply chain. In Latin America, where China is the second largest trading partner, the viral outbreak has disrupted large shipments to China. Perishable products have taken a much bigger hit. In the U.S., tech titan's Apple shares fell 2 percent and also dragged the stocks of its suppliers around the world. That, after the iPhone maker warned of lower sales in the current quarter due to constraints on iPhone production and Chinese demand. But many experts did say the epidemic strain on the economy will be short-lived like SARS in 2003. Although growth in the current quarter is seen to be low, China's economy is expected to pick up and even skyrocket after the epidemic. This will help boost the global economy as well. More on the impact of the coronavirus on global trade. We are joined on the phone in Beijing by He Weiwen, a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Many have witnessed uh, the fact that many of our Chinese uh, uh, participants, in fact, of the discussion are 
actually joining us through phones because of the outbreak now going on in China. In Washington, D.C., we also have Anna Ashton, the Senior Director of Government Affairs of U.S. China Business Council. Last but not least, in London, Ian Begg, a professor at the European Institute of London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program. want to go to both of you, Ms. Ashton and Professor Begg, first about you know, where China is now, after several weeks of uh, coronavirus outbreak in this country, what does the rest of the world know now about the value of China in terms of global supply chain and interconnectedness? Uh, Ms. Ashton. Well, of course, you know, I, I don't think that it took the coronavirus for people to know that China is an incredibly important part of the global supply chain for almost everything you can think of but but you know maybe for those not paying particularly close attention they know now um, and if the virus continues to play out in such a way that um, it prevents full return to work for you know several more weeks then I think that that will be felt even more keenly which isn't necessarily a bad thing sometimes it's good to be reminded of the importance of the relationship and the interconnectedness of our economies. Mm. I wonder whether that is the one of those uh, so-called silver linings of this uh, very devastating situation of fighting a public health uh, uh, crisis. Having said that though, Professor Begg, uh, your take from the European perspective about the same issue. Well, there's the first thing to say is that the supply chains are inevitably going to be disrupted but they won't really have hit yet because things that have been in transit for a few weeks will still be arriving and it's only in this the current period that the production will have gone down in vital suppliers and will therefore start to affect the, the supply uh, the, the, the users of those supplies in the future. I think we can probably equate it a bit with the kinds of trade frictions that arise through what we've seen over the last two or three years, namely mm -hmm. the, the attempts to impose tariffs and other trade restrictions. They too disrupt supply chains, so we are aware of the consequences. The only silver lining I can see is that it might push some companies in some uh, markets for China to look for alternatives and that may be, may be a boost to them. So the, the silver lining is, is that China's gray sky, the cost of China's gray skies. Interesting. Uh, Ms. Ashton, if I could uh, just continue that point. We have seen, which I mentioned earlier in our programs uh, earlier this week, uh, MCM Vietnam survey of its members. Uh, suggesting, which is a sister organization to yours as well, uh, suggesting that many of their members, American business certainly in Vietnam, find it very hard to restart their operation because many of the uh, parts and components of their production actually is coming from China. So it seems that it's not just uh, China, U.S., it's uh, many other countries that we are all on this global supply chain. So uh, what does this provide us with a second thought about whether we know well or not the real nature of this global supply chain worldwide? Not you, I guess, you know about that very well every day through your work, but really people that are making policies in different governments, people that are looking at media reports, people that are doing media reports. Uh, do we really know that well the nature of the global supply chain? Well, to be honest with you, I think none of us can truly grasp uh, the myriad ways that there are interconnections between businesses in different parts of the world and um, the enormous potential for negative impacts for different industries and different companies. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's something that will have surprises for all of us, even those of us who watch it closely, um, depending on how this plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, we certainly have heard people suggest that this is you know, a reason for companies to consider greater diversification of their supply chains. I would say you know, companies were already considering that because of the tariffs and the trade war. And to a certain extent, that is a good thing, not just for U.S. companies or European companies, but for mm -hmm. all companies to have you know, backup ways of ensuring that their supply chain remains operational. But at the same time, it's not going to change the fact that China's an enormous consumer market and all of these companies also want to be able to sell to China. And even if the supply chain was not disrupted, 
sales would be disrupted right now because China is going through uh, a major humanitarian crisis and, mm -hmm. and doing its best to contend with that. So mm -hmm. uh, no matter how you slice it, China always remains important in this equation. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. He, uh, who is joining us on the phone here in Beijing, uh, listening to your other colleagues, uh, your thoughts about the same issues? Well, I think certainly the, uh, the COVID-19 has caught China surprised because we did not expect such a huge epidemic happening across the country. So we are taking shots. However, uh, we are working at our best efforts, try to control the situation and resume production as soon as possible. The implication for the world economy is obvious because China accounts for one-sixth of the world economy. Any one percentage job in China's GDP means one-sixth percent of job in global GDP. Mm. And the more direct implication is interruption of global supply chain. For instance, uh, in the automotive sector, uh, Nissan of Japan and also Hyundai in South Korea suspended their home production for a short period because of the interruption of the parts and components supplied from China. And also Germany had one-third of their automotive output in China. The suspension of China's uh, their factories in China cost 60 million euro mm -hmm. for their profit per day. So it is obvious. On the other hand, not only the immediate implication, but also it creates uncertainty. The companies have to postpone their investment decisions, which will affect their future growth. Mm. Well, we have seen, uh, Mr. He, uh, one after another, the pressures uh, over the past uh, few years uh, starting from the big uh, protracted uh, U.S.-China trade war now to another uh, layer of difficulties as a result of this uh, uh, public health uh, crisis. Uh, do you think uh, the Chinese economy and China's interaction with either Europe or the United States, two of China's largest uh, uh, business partners, will be able to endure this uh, within, let's just say, still a few weeks to go at least, if you look at the latest uh, numbers? Yeah. Uh, I think the, it's still too early to make any firm assessment mm. for the future trade uh, prospect with the, both the United States and Europe and other trading partners because we have only one, more than one month of interruption mm. and how things will develop. It depends predominantly on the length and depth of the COVID-19. Yeah. We have already seen lights at the end of the tunnel because we have seen constant drop in the new cases and the new mortalities. And not only non-Hubei regions, but also in Hubei itself and Wuhan itself. So we hope this favorable trend will continue. Barring any rebound of new cases, we will see some basic control by next month. In yeah. that case, the affection will be short-lived. Uh, Professor Begg, one of the things we do not know about public health crisis is we cannot predict. There are so many factors that are making it unpredictable. So as a result of this, there's discussion not just about China, but also the rest of the world. We have seen Japan, South Korea, uh, and even some of the European countries. The number of COVID-19 confirmed cases, U.S. included too, have been up. Uh, to a certain extent, we feel very sad about that news. But that could also mean, besides China, a big chunk of the global economy, there are other economies that are also very significant, are experiencing uncertainties too, Professor Begg. Well, that's exactly right. And this is the, the trouble we're trying to analyze something like a, an unknown virus. Or it's now a known virus, but it's a novel virus that we don't quite know the significance of. It could escalate into a major global pandemic 
Or it could be that the action that China has taken, plus the very severe restrictions that other countries are imposing on qu in quarantining anybody who seemed to have the virus, mm -hmm. that could nip it in the bud very quickly. So we're, we're at that point of uncertainty of not knowing what the e epidemiological aspect of this would be, mm -hmm. and that therefore translates into not knowing what the eventual economic impact would be. If the spread from China is stopped now, and all the quarantine measures continue to work in the rest of the world, mm. then the rest of the world will be only affected by the Chinese supply shock. But if it gets loose and turns into a global pandemic, then we can expect a serious hit to the global economy. Therefore, what China is doing to prevent the spread of the virus is vital for everybody. Mm. Uh, Ms. Ashton, we've been hearing about stories from the Japanese uh, cruise ship like a uh, Diamond uh, Princess and the people who have left the ship are being infected and now they are going to different countries around the world. Some are having efficient quarantine measures, some may not necessarily be able to do so uh, as a result of various reasons. So uh, Ms. Ashton, this really a very a different layer now we are talking about of uncertainties. How businesses like members of yours be able to make their decisions, particularly the first half of the year? Sure. Well, you know, businesses uh, like certainty very, very much. <laughs> and, you know, when there is a situation where the environment is uncertain and there's a question as to how long that uncertainty will last, they tend to do things like postpone investments. Um, postpone ma making major business decisions and so I think we can expect that um, you know the reality is that even though there have been a lot of comparisons made to SARS this is necessarily going to be different from SARS because China was I think the sixth largest economy in 2003 now it's the second mm -hmm. it's much more integrated with the rest of the world and it's a uh, it's a very important economy, but also global trade is much more significant than it was in 2003. Mm -hmm. So it, it is. It's very difficult to know exactly what to expect from all of this. It's a good test for, I think, our global ability to respond to future crises. And it's uh, an opportunity for us all to sort of become more aware of the shortfalls right now that exist in our, in our systems mm -hmm. and in our planning, like the fact that there are 12 million Chinese medical professionals who need um, surgical grade masks every day and there are only something like 600,000 made per day in the world. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately China is sort of the test case for all of it. I don't envy China that position but I think China is doing the best it can. Mm. That is really an important uh, layer of thought. Uh, also to you Mr. Beck about that. I mean earlier we've been thinking about hmm, trade will be the pillar of the world as long as we have trade everything will be fine we've been thinking hmm, terrorism will be the biggest threat to the world and uh, a geopolitics as we have been discussing over the past two years especially that between China and the United States but now you know with one public health crisis uh, that we have witnessed uh, this is already a huge challenge to the human society, uh, almost uh, incapable at this point still, we, w whichever area you're talking about, whether it's academic research, whether it's about the therapeutic treatment or vaccines, whether it's about academic co uh, coordination, whether it is uh, about uh, uh, economic uh, cooperation as a result of this uh, stress test, many areas are not giving very satisfying answers. So Professor Begg, uh, does this provide us with a second thought about how should we conduct our next uh, step uh, of uh, planning for the world and also for our own economies? Well, it, it pushes us to recognize what's already been said by Anna, that there is this strong degree of interconnectedness in our economies and anything that arises as a kind of friction between our economies is going to disrupt to a far greater degree than we, we might have been used to in the past when national economies were far more closed relative to the rest of the world. So it forces global governance to recognize that there are things to confront. Now we've done this before. We, we had the financial crisis mm. emanating from the Western countries in, in the late 2000s. In the end that was, that was at least alleviated by having a collective macroeconomic response. Now we can expect a collective uh, biological response. So mm -hmm. There will be a race on to get the vaccine. There will be races on to 
quadruple the number of uh, surgical face masks that are being produced. All of these become business opportunities as well as impediments. So we shouldn't be too downbeat about it, mm -hmm. even while recognizing the downside risks. Mm -hmm. This, however, is happening at a time, if I could compare to 2003 when SARS broke out. This is a very different time of the world because at that time, globalization was the key word. And now, uh, Mr. He, if I could go to you about that question, globalization has been put into a question mark uh, by some of the economies, at least the governments, and therefore global coordination efforts is under extreme stress test in this time's uh, uh, public health uh, crisis. Mr. He, how do you see that, this stress test uh, about the common goals and as a result, its impact on the global trade? Uh, I don't think there is a fundamental change of globalization a current time from what, uh, when the SARS happened 17 years ago, because globalization is an economic law, economic activities relates to the interests of all the countries. The deglobalization or anti-globalization, the political change, the policies or trade policies, they can affect globalization but not change that. And if we refer to SARS 17 years ago, people used to like to compare the current COVID-19 to SARS 17 years ago. But in my view, SARS is only a reference, it's no comparison because COVID-19 is much, much more serious, either in dimension, scale, or implications than SARS. Because in SARS, we had altogether 5,700 cases. Now we have already 74,000. And in SARS, only Beijing, Guangzhou, two cities were restricted relatively strongly, and other cities were barely unaffected. And there was no factory closures or uh, school uh, closures or shops closures. So this mm. just uh, as usual. So this is more serious, much more serious. But in 19, I mean the year 2003, the whole year, because the Q2 economy was affected, was two percentage down. But the whole year of 2003, we saw a GDP growth of 10.1 percent, higher than 2002, which was 9.2, and especially mm. trade, which shot up by. 37.1% for the whole year 2003. Of course, we cannot see that trend to this year. Yeah. A global trend in trade, we cannot see that prospect. But regarding GDP, I think if nothing unexpected happened in Q2, if we can control the COVID-19 yeah. by, say, April, I, we can see, expect a strong rebound starting from Q2 up to the second half. So All the right. whole year performances would be similar. All right. Well, you are very brave in giving your predictions, I have to say, Mr. He. But if I could bring up uh, the other two panelists uh, with us, uh, I want to wrap up our conversation. Time is up. But before we go, uh, from now until we see the lights at the end of the tunnel, how much effort and in what way shall we work together? Ms. Ashton, your thoughts first. I think that there is cooperation going on every second um, in a variety of ways. I know a lot of our companies have worked very hard to get their operations back up and running if they are providing critical supplies mm -hmm. and to also find ways to assist with the relief efforts. And I, you know, I can't speak for other companies out there, but I am certain that they're doing the same. Um, you know, I think that this should be a catalyst for cooperation and. Uh, history will will provide this as a lesson on the importance of cooperation. I hope that it ends up being a good lesson. I hope it ends up being an example of, you know, successful cooperation and how important yeah. successful cooperation is. If it's not a good lesson, hopefully we'll still learn the lesson. <laughs> We hope it's a good lesson and uh, also it's a demonstration of uh, cooperation and perseverance from all of us. Uh, Professor Beck, also your final thought. Well, it's a test for the multilateral system. In recent programs, we've, we've talked much more about the World Trade Organization. Now it's the World Health Organization, also a Geneva-based entity which is in the, the front line. 
it's a test, as Anna said, for global cooperation. And what we should emphasize is there is a common good in all of this. Everybody mm -hmm. has to subscribe to it, try to deal with it. And the last thing I'd say to you, Wei, is you be safe, and I hope the, the World Insight team avoids any kind of contacts. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Professor Beck. I really appreciate the, all the, the thrill of you joining us and have this very important discussion. Ian Beck and Ashton and He Wei Wen with us on the phone. All the best and be healthy as well to all of you and your family members. Thank you.